The Claw of Death. Hidden in the dense woods outside Pripyat lies one of the most unsettling remnants of the Chernobyl disaster. A colossal steel claw, frozen in its final act. The claw, once part of a crane used in the cleanup after Reactor 4 exploded, has become an unintentional monument to the catastrophe, so radioactive that mere contact could be deadly. This digger claw, nicknamed the Claw of Death, began its terrible legacy in the chaotic weeks following April 26, 1986, when Chernobyl's reactor erupted in an explosion of steam and flames. The blast was so intense, it hurled control rods, fuel, and radioactive graphite blocks, some weighing hundreds of pounds, onto the rooftops surrounding the reactor building. This graphite, which had absorbed massive amounts of radiation from the reactor core, turned the rooftops into some of the most radioactive places on Earth. Standing on these surfaces for even a minute would lead to fatal radiation sickness, the lethal doses accumulating faster than any protection could counter. In those early days, the Soviet cleanup teams faced a desperate dilemma. The graphite had to be moved to avoid further contamination, but neither humans nor most machines could survive prolonged exposure. Robots were deployed to remove the graphite, but they lasted only minutes before the intense radiation fried their circuits. With few other options, Soviet workers turned to machines like the crane, whose claw became part of the final line of defense in pushing radioactive debris back into the shattered core. Every time it grabbed another block, radiation accumulated in the steel. By the time it had completed its task, the claw was beyond rescue, a piece of machinery now nearly as radioactive as the debris it had moved. Afterward, cleanup teams transported it, or perhaps abandoned it, to a secluded part of the forest, far from human habitation. But in 2019, archaeologist Robert Maxwell stumbled upon it during a private tour. Venturing into the forest with a Geiger counter, he came face to face with the claw's eerie, latent power. Quote, When I had my encounter with the claw, let's just say it was screamingly radioactive, Maxwell told news.com.au. The counter screamed as he measured its radiation levels, climbing past 39.8 microsieverts per hour, hundreds of times higher than safe background levels. In a single day, the claw radiates about 950 microsieverts, enough to put anyone near it at risk of serious illness. Maxwell's encounter with the claw wasn't without caution. Quote, You're constantly aware of contamination, he explained, noting how radioactive dust can cling to surfaces or be inhaled threatening anyone who lingers too long. Yet, despite warnings and the claw's infamy, it has continued to attract a few daring tourists. One particularly controversial photo shows two female visitors climbing inside the claw, grinning and posing for the camera as if it were an amusement park prop. Today, the claw sits undisturbed. Some locals believe it will remain there indefinitely, a machine that can no longer serve but cannot safely be removed. The Grey Sand. In the dark, dripping basement of Pripyat's abandoned Jupiter factory, something disturbing lies in wait. Vast containers of black and gray sand, laced with radioactive elements, seem to pulse with secrets buried in the shadows of Chernobyl. Was this sand part of a forgotten experiment, a relic of a darker purpose? What was such dangerously radioactive materials doing in the basement of a supposedly civilian factory? Opened in 1980, on the outskirts of the now abandoned city, the Jupiter factory manufactured cassette recorders and home electronics. But its official role, it seems, was a cover for covert operations in semiconductor production, supporting Soviet military needs. Employing over 3,500 people at its peak, Jupiter remained partially active even after the 1986 Chernobyl disaster, quietly conducting radiological research before its final closure in 1996. As rumors grew about this hidden military lab, so did the interest surrounding its basement, a space now known for housing containers of a mysterious powder. The sand itself, a gray-black powder, is supposedly unnervingly radioactive. 
measured by sun explorers at levels over 2,500 microsieverts per hour. Analysis from one scientific explorer has shown that it contains elements directly linked to Chernobyl's RBMK nuclear reactors, such as strontium-90, cesium-137, and plutonium. In a site already infamous for contamination, these readings rank among the most dangerous outside the reactor core. Adding to the mystery, shelves upon shelves of soil bags, clear and labeled, surround the sand. Some believe these samples are essential to Jupiter's secondary mission, to research radiation decontamination techniques in the exclusion zone's early years. Others have proposed that the gray sand might be tied to a production method using the RBMK-1000 reactor to irradiate silicon ingots, producing neutron-doped silicon, essential for the electronics used in nuclear detectors. Still, theories of hidden nuclear weapons production have surfaced, though logistics and the factory's small scale make these improbable. The Soviet Union's primary nuclear facilities, like the Mayak plant, were purpose-built and tightly guarded, far from any populated area. At least one recent explorer has dismissed the sand as merely active carbon used in protective applications. According to his post on Reddit, the radiation in the room is minor and emanates from objects near the sand, like a shoe and a bag of old firefighter equipment used in early decontamination efforts. As Jupiter's legacy fades into decay, the basement's mysterious sand is a reminder of the factory's ghostly double life. Was this gray sand simply a relic of Soviet-era decontamination tests? Or was it one final mystery left beneath the quiet ruins of Pripyat? AZ-5 In the early hours of April 26, 1986, the reactor control room of Chernobyl's Unit 4 pulsed with the glow of warning lights and the anxious murmurs of engineers. They were conducting a safety test to determine whether the reactor's cooling pumps could continue running on residual turbine power in the event of a power outage. At the center of this controlled chaos was a single red button, the AZ-5. Designed as the ultimate failsafe, Pressing this button should shut down the reactor in seconds. Yet on this fateful night, no one knew it would act as a detonator. At 1.23 a.m., reactor operator Leonid Toptunov broke the tamper-evident wax seal on the AZ-5 button, removed its plastic cover, and pressed down, intending to conclude the safety test on Reactor 4. This action initiated an emergency scram procedure, which was designed to halt the nuclear reactions by inserting control rods made of neutron-absorbing boron carbide. However, the rods had a critical design flaw. Their tips were made of graphite, a material that, unlike the rest of the rod, actually increased reactivity. As the control rods began to descend, they displaced neutron-absorbing water with this graphite, temporarily increasing the rate of nuclear reactions. In the unstable conditions already present within Reactor 4, this unexpected surge in reactivity sent the reactor's power soaring out of control. Within seconds, the control rods jammed only a third of the way down, leaving the reactor unable to fully shut down. The intense spike in power caused the fuel rods to overheat and shatter, rapidly generating steam at a rate the reactor could not contain. The resulting pressure violently breached the reactor vessel, triggering explosions that ejected radioactive material and destroyed much of the building's structure. A controversial theory suggests that Toptonov may have pressed the AZ-5 button twice. The first press, under this theory, was an attempt to manage a slight power increase by partially inserting the control rods a few centimeters, halting their descent when he released the button. However, as power continued to rise, he pressed it again in earnest, this time to initiate a full shutdown. This double press, according to proponents of the theory, jammed the rods in a position that maximized the reactor's explosive potential, sealing its fate. While unproven, the theory raises questions about whether a split-second decision and a flawed button design contributed to the disaster's unprecedented sequence of events. Today, the AZ-5 button in the Reactor 4 control room exists only as an empty socket, the button and its protective cover likely removed as unofficial souvenirs during the early cleanup operations after the disaster. These buttons were later replaced with switches in updated reactors, 
of the empty socket of the AZ-5 button remains a haunting reminder of the catastrophic sequence it once initiated. Basement of Pripyat Hospital, number 126. The basement of Pripyat's hospital, number 126, holds no bodies, yet it remains perhaps one of the most haunting burial chambers in modern history. Here, beneath the crumbling Soviet-era hospital complex, lie the abandoned uniforms, helmets, and boots of the first firefighters who rushed to contain the Chernobyl disaster, items so radioactive that after nearly four decades, they can still deliver a lethal dose within hours. The hospital, located on Druzhby Narodov Street, once served Pripyat's 49,000 residents, many of them workers at the nearby power plant. Its roof bore an optimistic slogan, Health of the Nation, the Country's Wealth. But in the early hours of April 26, 1986, that promise crumbled, along with the roof of Reactor 4. Lieutenant Vladimir Pravik and his men felt the explosions that would reshape history. They didn't hesitate. Within minutes, they were racing toward the smoke, billowing from the nuclear power plant. What began with Provik's initial team of 14 would soon swell into a massive emergency response. 37 fire crews, comprising 186 firefighters, commanding 81 engines, drawn from across the Kyiv region, all converging on a disaster they couldn't see or fully comprehend. Racing against time and physics, Provik's team faced the immediate challenge of reaching the reactor's roof, some 230 feet up. With the facility's internal firefighting systems destroyed by the explosion, they had to manually lay hoses for their trucks. In temperatures exceeding 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, they battled fires fueled by 70 tons of uranium and 900 tons of graphite, unaware they were being exposed to radiation levels six to seven times the lethal dose, roughly 20,000 Renkin per hour. Hospital 126 began filling with casualties by dawn. No official announcement had been made about the disaster, but by 10 a.m., 108 firefighters and plant workers had arrived, many still wearing their contaminated gear. Protocol dictated that anyone exposed to radiation should have been decontaminated at the plant before transport. Instead, the radioactive uniforms were hastily stripped and thrown into the basement, where they remain today. This decision transformed the subterranean space into one of the most dangerous places in Pripyat. The toll of the firefighters' work was swift and devastating. Pravik and his team had spent crucial minutes on the reactor's roof, pouring water onto the burning core. The radiation was so intense, it allegedly changed the color of Pravik's eyes. Of the 237 emergency workers who developed acute radiation sickness, 28 would die within the first three months. Modern-day visitors to the hospital basement with Geiger counters report readings that still surge off the scale. Yet this hasn't deterred everyone. In recent years, disaster tourists have ventured into the basement, some leaving with deadly souvenirs. One firefighter's helmet disappeared, leaving behind only its highly radioactive straps, a reminder that these artifacts aren't mere historical curiosities, but active threats capable of killing even decades later. The hospital itself still shows evidence of the sudden evacuation of Pripyat's residents. Medical charts remain spread across desks. Empty cribs rust in the maternity ward, and surgical tools lie, eternally waiting for operations that will never be performed. But it's the basement that still tells the most profound story. Room 3052. In the depths of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, an ominous threat stirs in silence. This is room 3052, a crumbling chamber where neutron counts, signals of potential nuclear reactions, have been steadily climbing over the past four years. At the heart of the danger lies a chilling remnant of the 1986 disaster, a mass of radioactive corium, the same substance that formed the infamous elephant's foot. When reactor four exploded, it unleashed a searing inferno with temperatures exceeding 2,900 degrees Fahrenheit. The fiery chaos melted uranium fuel rods, concrete, steel, and even sand into a bubbling molten slurry weighing nearly a hundred tons. This deadly mixture surged through cracks and pipes, flowing downward like lava. As it cooled, 
The mass crystallized into grotesque formations, jagged stalactites, frozen waves, and most notoriously, the elephant's foot. This two-ton behemoth of Corium, wrinkled and blackened like its namesake, was discovered eight months after the explosion. At the time, it emitted a staggering 10,000 Rinken per hour, enough to kill anyone who approached within minutes. Even capturing its image was a battle against radiation. Film and electronic equipment failed under its intensity. Scientists, desperate to study it, tried drilling into its hardened, glassy surface, but failed. In the end, they resorted to shooting in it with a Kalashnikov rifle to break off fragments for analysis. Decades later, the peril of Chernobyl has not entirely subsided. Room 3052 now confronts researchers with a growing puzzle and a renewed danger. The neutron counts signal potential fission activity, even as the room itself deteriorates. Its ceiling has partially collapsed, and a steel plate from the reactor dangles precariously above the radioactive formations. The unstable environment, coupled with lethal radiation levels, keeps even the bravest scientists at bay. To unravel this mystery, researchers have turned to the lab. Using original materials from the disaster site, they recreate Chernobyl's corium under controlled conditions. These safer replicas offer crucial insights into the behavior of the radioactive lava, guiding efforts to prevent further catastrophe as the neutron levels in room 3052 continue their unsettling rise. The solution, however, is far from straightforward. Plans are underway to send robots into the room to drill into the formations and insert boron rods, which can absorb excess neutrons and halt the chain reactions. Yet the material, once impervious to industrial drills, has become fragile over time, crumbling at the slightest touch. Each step requires painstaking experimentation to avoid unintended consequences. Even the elephant's foot, once rock solid and resistant to gunfire, has degraded into a sand-like consistency. This deterioration raises new fears. Any disturbance could release radioactive dust into the air. Meanwhile, in room 3052, the fragile balance of moisture levels looms as another hazard. Too much or too little, and the conditions for renewed fission could be met. The story of Chernobyl is far from over. As the haunting relics of its past defy time, they serve as both a reminder and a warning. The forces unleashed that fateful night in 1986 remain a danger, still shaping the future in unforeseen ways. Which artifact from Chernobyl do you think holds the most untold secrets? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.